for the federal government, I can say without missing words that the decision by the British government to put Nigeria on the red list just because of less than 2,000 cases of Omicron, which by the way did not originate in Nigeria, is unjust, unfair, punitive, indefensible, and discriminatory. The decision is also not driven by science or common sense. Under the revised protocol, passengers arriving in Nigeria are expected to provide evidence of and comply with the following rules. One, COVID-19 PCR test to be done within 48 hours before departure. Post-arrival day two COVID-19 PCR test. Self-isolation for seven days for unvaccinated and partially vaccinated individuals. The seven post-arrival exit PCR test for unvaccinated and partially vaccinated individuals. All right, welcome back. It's still The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. You just uh, watched the video there. The Minister of um, Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, uh, you know, reacting to the UK, uh, you know, travel ban on Nigeria being placed on uh, the red list. You know, that particular development has actually uh, brought about a, a whole lot of anger. Uh, the, with the federal government saying that Britain's decision uh, was based on discrimination, not scientific, uh, and also uh, prejudice. Uh, we have uh, two guests uh, who will be joining us to look at all over the anger goes the economic political uh, you know it of course are medical angles to all of that issue we have uh, the commissioner for uh, health uh, from cross river state uh, uh, better and of course uh, we have um, the uh, a political affairs analyst uh, um, his name is uh, Kenichu Kenichu and both of them will be joining us in this discourse uh, this time around good morning to you uh, gentlemen and lady thanks for joining us on the breakfast and plus tv africa Thank you for having us. All right, uh, let me just uh, bring on the political or social angle to uh, this discussion. I'll start with you, uh, Kenichiko Namani. You know, uh, the Minister of Information, uh, Lai Mohammed, addressed them, the press uh, yesterday, and he, you know, uh, expressed a lot of anger concerning this particular development. And he said that um, the UK's decision was based on discrimination, and he said that it was uh, not scientific, and uh, he also said it was um, prejudice. Uh, do you agree with his position, uh, Kenichiko? Um, uh, slightly, I would say I, I agree with his position because um, popularly um, we've heard that the Omicron variant of the virus um, is mild at the moment. So, and if you think about other countries that have um, other increased cases of Omicron and the uh, UK, they're not banning those other countries. You wonder um, if it's discriminatory or just um, political. I'm, I'm not sure what, what that is, but... Um, based on science at the moment, I, I think we're still at that particular phase where we're not a threat to any country at the moment. Okay, so uh, let's also bring in, you know, the Commissioner for Health, Cross River State, Dr. Bata Adu. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. All right, so um, now you also have, I mean, there are some of those countries that have cases of Omicron variant. You have Germany, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Israel, Hong Kong. The list is almost endless. How come Nigeria is put on that list and Africa as a continent? So um, first, I just think very strongly that the decision taken to ban flights from Nigeria into the UK was absolutely unnecessary. I also strongly think that um, stopping visa issuance to Nigerians who intend to visit the UK was equally very, very unnecessary. Um, it's very, very clear that the Omicron variant, even though it's a new variant, will not or cannot be as virulent, as heavy, as bad as other COVID-19 um, variants that we have seen over time. And this has been scientifically proven. Like you said, there's Omicron virus in the United States. You have it in Canada, you have it in Germany, you have it in France, you have it in several other countries. And this ban, this red listing, this red flag was not raised on those countries. Why Nigeria? 
over this period of the pandemic, it's been very, very clear that Nigeria has been able to put up a strong response that has prevented its citizens from dying. The expectation was that people would die like flies on the road in Nigeria, in Africa. But that's not happening. The response has been fair enough. And so if we are not putting a ban on you because you had too many cases and we're afraid that you come in with your cases into Nigeria, it's unfair for you to put a ban on us that we should not come into the UK. Remember, people have businesses, people have different discussions, meetings and the rest of it that could help them open up their economic space. And then you're stopping all of this just abruptly. Really, really, there's no scientific basis for this. The World Health Organization has stated very, very clearly that there is no scientific um, um, backing to punish countries who came out to tell you that, look, we have this variant. It's like saying the Delta variant. Why didn't you stop us for the Delta variant, which was even more virulent than Omicron? Why didn't you stop us for the new variant or any other variant that was in our country or in the South Africa or somewhere else, right? Really, really, we need to review all of this. And I want to call on the UK government to please take up that ban. It's completely uncalled for and it's not necessary. All right, um, uh, the Presidential Steering Committee uh, is saying that uh, they will respond appropriately uh, soon. You know, but then, don't you think uh, we have been too reactionary to all of this, uh, in as much as uh, you know, we have been uh, you know, uh, banned from entering the UK, Nigerian studies? Uh, shouldn't we be doing uh, maybe some sort of a, re a retaliatory move? And uh, then again, uh, if you look at it, would you really say that it's like a, a regional vendetta uh, on Africans, really? Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It's um, regional. And then um, uh, the part of retaliation, I think, is very necessary because um, so many people, um, so many countries out there are looking at Nigeria. And what UK did at the moment is, is a way of looking down on Nigeria um, as a whole. Nigeria is, is a powerful country in Africa. And then when you treat us this particular way, um, other countries that are smaller than Nigeria somehow should be looking out to see what Nigeria is going to do. And um, I think uh, on the Nigerian part, what we should do at the moment is show a diplomatic retaliation because it makes no sense where possibly in the UK we have more Omicron cases. And they are, um, I think they're about um, daily we have um, British Airways flying into the country with uh, hundreds of people coming in from the UK and then putting us at risk of even increasing our number of Omicron virus, but they are moving first to um, ban Nigerians from coming in. And just like the Honorable Commissioner said, um, banning Nigeria is one thing, but then moving forward to um, stop visa issuance is another thing. That means it's not, it's not about the Omicron virus, because you can issue visa, and if there's a ban, people will not travel. I mean, nobody's going to get to your airport and fly away, you know, and probably go into the country. So there's probably something beyond the Omicron virus that they are trying to, um, to, to go after, but they're using Omicron virus as an excuse. And at this point, Nigeria as a big country in Africa should think towards uh, diplomatic retaliation. Okay, so uh, we also have, uh, you know, Dr. Beta uh, right here with us. I, I would also like to share your thoughts on the AU, that's the African Union. Of course, we know that they're saddled with the responsibility of ensuring that, you know, the fight against uh, emergencies in the continent is properly taken care of. How would you describe AU's response to the fight against COVID-19 and other variant? And, you know, the response of African leaders, you know, to the fight against COVID-19. In all fairness, I think um, the AU and indeed African leaders have shown a lot of uh, resilience and leadership as it concerns um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the response from African leaders was really, really not expected. Um, different countries created a presidential tax force and there was direct support from the country's budget into um, fighting uh, the, the Omicron, uh, sorry, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this was really very epic, first of its kind. Even the private sector came into the space to see that they can help. I think AU has done well. However, AU needs to emphasize on the need for African countries to begin to produce vaccines, on the need for African countries to increase the number of vaccinated persons. I think this is where the attention should go right now. 
if we have most of our population vaccinated, whether it's Omicron or it's Delta or it's Mu or it's Beta or it's whatever name it answers, right? We're not afraid because we know the majority of the population is covered and they have herd immunity already, right? But AU has not been able to push effectively on this. We've been able to get some donation vaccines from different countries, but it's not enough to, to feed the African population. I think AU should move on with governments of various countries to ensure and build vaccine companies, manufacturing companies that will manufacture vaccines in Africa. That way we have our sovereignty. That way we can be able to give our own citizens first before sending out to anybody. Imagine India. India is almost a Nigeria. A lot of persons, the population is really, really large. And of course, they have most of the issues that we have in Nigeria, but they are able to produce vaccines, save their own population, and then even go to save population in developed world and in other countries that are requiring their help. We need to move as African Union to take this bold step, produce vaccines, give to our people, and let them use it to protect themselves. More importantly, AU should be able to speak up at, at points like this, when African countries are being blacklisted, redlisted, banned, and all of it. AU should be able to speak up for us as African countries. We have a voice, we have a say, and we should be able to whatever diplomatic global politics that is going on to ensure that trade and economy continues. Let our borders not be shut for any reason. Because look, if we are developing, we need all it takes to develop, right? So at this point where we have recession in several countries where COVID has brought things to a halt, this is not the time to joke about it. AU should be at the forefront, pushing for all those bans to be taken off of all African countries and at the same time providing vaccine for the general population. Yes, because um, uh, just before I, you know, I let my colleague in uh, this point in time, the, the major concern, if you look at the bitterness and the argument in the spaces across board, you will find that, that when China, when you know the virus actually broke out, I mean, there were a lot of um, uh, pressure. There were a lot of ways where China was going to be. We constantly had the, the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, constantly saying that it was a Chinese virus. And that was totally fought against. There was no point at any point or in time that you know, China was actually blacklisted. And so um, it's quite worrisome that up until this point, I really haven't had any response, apart from the fact, of course, that the Nigerian government has reacted. But how many African countries have actually stood up? And what is the leadership of the AU doing in this direction? But um, we're hoping that, you know, like you have rightly mentioned, they would wake up to this cause and uh, we would also uh, understand that the continent uh, has a strong leadership. All right, uh, indeed, um, no doubt, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Betty uh, Better, you talked about um, trade and economic activities actually being affected. Let me uh, bring in uh, uh, Dr. Kenetriko. You are a businessman, you know. Let's just look at the economic impact um, of all of this, uh, you know, policy right now. You know, with the AU not ha actually putting a, a strong, uh, a firm stand concerning this, no doubt the nation's aviation, uh, you know, the visa and uh, immigration, um, you know, policy that are being affected right now. But then again, what is the exact impact? If we have to look at uh, uh, statistics and figures, I know, what would you say or how much of an impact would it really have on um, you know, industries and uh, people doing business here in Nigeria with this particular travel ban? Although it's just been about a few days, so what's the, what's the main impact as, 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 as we speak right now, uh, Kinechiku? Um, so it, it's, it's going to be of um, great impact, especially, for example, for the travel industry. Um, first of all, uh, like I said earlier, you know, we have a whole lot of Nigerians traveling to the UK every single day. And then we contribute greatly um, to the economic situation over there in, in, in UK. Now, if you look at the healthcare sector, you realize that we have a lot of um, doctors flying um, into Nigeria from the UK to take on very big cases like surgeries. Um, and then um, this travel ban is definitely going to stop a whole lot of things because some of these doctors who are resident in the UK um, actually uh, are probably not citizens of the UK. And then when you look at doctors who are flying out of Nigeria to visit the UK for technical um, maybe courses um, for them to know how to uh, probably like use laparoscopic surgeries and, and stuff like that, 
And all these things are going to be shut down at the moment because of the travel ban. Now, if you look at um, the, the, the cargo side of it, there are so many other companies who are dealing with cargo. There are people who are doing express shipments and they are using these airlines to bring in their shipments. So because of the turnout of people who are traveling to the UK and not traveling to the UK at the moment, there's going to be like a break um, from Africa connecting to UK. So the impact um, is very, very great in different sectors. Now, but what they're not looking at uh, as well is the impact uh, to their own economy. I'm, I'm not sure if they're looking in that direction because we contribute a lot to their own economy. And then uh, in as much as we expect them to open up the border and, um, and stop the travel ban, you would also look at the coin in two sides as well. Um, when you talk about South Africa and the ban on South Africa, South Africa has like a very great, um, I mean, um, communication and system at their airports. But then if you look at what is happening in Nigeria, I was in the UK like two weeks ago. And then before I fly into the UK, I have to actually book my COVID test um, in a reputable um, company over there in, in UK. And then once I get into the UK, um, I'm registered as a traveler that just got into the UK. And then I go straight to, um, um, to, to isolation. And then um, the sample collection kit is going to be sent to my address. And then after the sample collection, I send it over for them to send in the results. Now, if you look at on a part of Nigeria, you realize that we pay for COVID testing um, the, the eight hours before we depart to Nigeria. And then upon arrival, you realize that so many people at the airport, not just the travelers, but the people in Nigeria at the airport are not observing COVID. You know what I mean? So if you look at what we what is happening in the Nigerian airport and what is happening in countries like Ghana and South Africa that are very organized, you would understand that this is actually, I wouldn't want to say the word racist, but uh, somehow it, you can say it's racist because some of these other countries have, have it all figured out, like Ghana and South Africa. And if we talk about banning based on that and based on protocols, maybe we'll be saying Nigeria, but then when you involve these other African countries, it makes no sense. And that's why the AU needs to come in. Is, it this, is this a deliberate move against Africa because Africa at this point in time is not even anywhere near um, what they, I mean, forecasted for Africa when it comes to COVID. So um, economy-wise in the whole of Africa, this is a big, um, a big problem because other countries are probably going to look at the UK and start buying African countries like there's something going on in Africa, but there's really nothing going on here. So this is not just about the UK. They can ban us and maybe we can deal with that. But when countries like uh, maybe Germany sees that, France sees that, Netherlands and these other countries, and they come in to start banning Nigeria, there's a whole lot that's going to happen because we'll have no choice but to want to retaliate. This is diplomatic. And then when we retaliate, it ends up affecting our economy as well because so many Nigerians depend on moving goods from one country to the other, and then we cannot survive this. Okay, so um, well, let's also bring in, you know, Dr. Beta, I do at this point in time. The WHO says the issues with low vaccination drive in rural areas. And you also have reports saying that about 3.6 billion doses of COVID-19 was, was administered globally. And out of that, you're looking at 78%. Uh, and out of all of that, the one that gets to, you know, the African continent, 1.3 billion people, is less than 7%. So what is the issue here? Uh, is it that the problem is with the low vaccination drive in you know, rural areas in Nigeria? The fact that uh, countries that are not part of the G20 cannot afford these vaccines or the vaccines is hoarded. Which is the issue, please? So very clearly, right, um, African countries have suffered from vaccine inequality inequality and all of that we have suffered from it so we are not on the a list we're not even on the b list we're just down the line so first and foremost countries that produce the vaccine will give the vaccines to their countries case one they will give the vaccine to their own population and then after that they are those great a countries which they will also send their vaccines to so even an indian uh, production will end up in in the US or the UK or somewhere else, which is a developed country, right? Because they are topmost on the list. And then what you get is just people of vaccines being donated to African countries. So far in Nigeria, we've received only 12 
million doses only so far only 12 million doses and remember that each person is supposed to take at least two doses so basically that can feed let's say six million nigerians with a population of 200 million persons that is completely important. it's not equitable in any manner at all it's not equitable so this discrimination, this global politics that is going on has affected vaccination in the country. So beyond us saying whether it's getting to rural areas or not, the vaccines are not even available. Nigeria as a country has paid for 40 million doses. But these doses have not arrived up until today. They have not arrived as we speak. They are saying between now and early February, the doses will come to the country. They give us the doses in small bits. So today, they give you 2 million. Tomorrow, they give you 1 million dose. Next tomorrow, that's the leftovers. Of course, we are grateful to the UK and the US for donating vaccines to Nigeria, right? But however, how many is it compared to the population that require this vaccine so that we can get herd immunity? So you cannot deprive us as a country for getting the adequate number of vaccines that we need and then you switch over and say, we have not vaccinated enough. The vaccines are not there. That's the truth. So now, apart from vaccines being there or not, we have issues at the local government levels, at the rural areas. In the main LGAs of the state, that's the headquarters, you will always find at least two ultra coaching equipment. And you will find a lot of coaching equipment that can carry these vaccines. However, when you move away from the center, when you move away from the um, headquarters or the state capital, it becomes very, very difficult to get coaching equipment that can sustain the process over time. We have also deployed different strategy, mass vaccination, using the polio vaccine strategy, and other things to see how we can increase the number, fighting vaccine resistance every other day. But the truth still remains. The number of doses that have come into Nigeria can only vaccinate basically 6 million persons for two doses. And if they should take booster doses, it will be less than 6 million persons. So a lot still needs to be done to bring in vaccine. And I hope Nigeria can take up this challenge in Africa and set up a vaccine manufacturing um, uh, company that will manufacture our own vaccine to serve Nigeria and the African region. This is one of the things I believe AU should come in. Do you think we have the capacity to do that? Because I also remember that recently you talked about, you know, molecular labs as being a challenge to the fight against, uh, you know, the recent Omicron variant. So do you think that as a country we have what it takes to set up these centers? Because we cannot constantly depend on uh, handouts of vaccine from these countries. So like you said, we can't depend on handouts. We cannot at all. Secondly, um, from the report at the NCH last week, NAFDAQ has confirmed that they have gone through the processes, about 843 processes that were required for Nigeria to get to the point where it can um, get vaccines. And so far, they have been able to achieve almost all. They have less than 48 left, 48 of those processes left to tick the checklist, and then we'll be ready to um, get produce vaccines in the country. One of it is research. And we have a biobank in Lagos that have been storing these um, uh, cells, these life cells of the COVID-19 virus, and they can be used to study. That way it qualifies us further to be able to um, produce vaccines in the country. But most importantly, we will require investors. And then the federal government must be committed to the vaccine production. Not just vaccine for COVID. We can use this as an entry point to begin to uh, produce vaccines for several other diseases, hepatitis, polio, and the rest of it. Remember that Nigeria gives billions of Naira every single year out of the country just to buy these vaccines that will be given to the population free of charge. This is a chance for us. Use this window, build your own vaccine plant, produce all the types of vaccines you require there, strengthen research, and bring experts in to build our capacity in the country. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Um, um, uh, Betty. Um, but let's uh, uh, 
bring up uh, you know Namani into this conversation. Doc the doctor has uh, said a whole lot of uh, economic angles to this. Uh, uh, don't you think uh, uh, investors, both locally and um, internationally, you know, should look in the direction of uh, you know maybe some sort of a PPP, a public private partnership, you know, and um, invest more into vaccine production, or, like she had said, not just for COVID, but, but, but for polio and all the illnesses that um, you know the continent is actually uh, being ravaged by. This should be an opportunity, you know, for Nigerian investors, don't you think, in the money? Um, <clears throat> so, like the Honorable Commissioner said, um, I would I would explain this uh, this point of view. Um, she said is is um, they are discriminating against Africa for not you know putting us in the forefront of receiving these vaccines, even though we pay for it. Now, uh, there's something I would like us to understand. This is global politics, and in all diplomatic um, um, sphere of communication, when it comes to um, either putting your country first. I want to believe that Nigeria is not playing the game well. Mm. Now, when you look at vaccination, importation of vaccination, COVID is, is a huge cash cow for so many countries. You realize that um, Nigeria is actually not discussing diplomatically with some of these countries because for you to get vaccine, pay for vaccines and get vaccines first or last or in the middle, you need to actually play diplomatic game. I'll give you a very typical example. Four or five years ago, I used to export uh, sesame seeds, um, peanuts to China. And these peanuts are readily available in Nigeria. But then, Nigeria is on the red list of China for bringing in peanuts into their country. But Senegal is on the green list to bring in peanuts into China. Now, it's very, very straightforward. There's the, the peanuts we have in Nigeria is going to produce more oil but Nigeria is on, the left, uh, is on the red list. Now, the question is, who is meant to go through that diplomatic negotiation with China to make sure Nigeria is bringing in peanuts into their country and for us to make much more money? So you realize that we are actually um, moving into these countries and focusing on what we are exporting as crude oil and so on and so forth, forgetting that there are so many other diplomatic conversations that we are meant to have to boost our economy or to boost our relationship with other countries. And if you use this case study with peanuts, you realize that it's almost the same thing that is happening with COVID. COVID, the more you don't have vaccine, the more you need to buy COVID kits, the more you need to test your people for COVID. So you need to understand that some countries understand this dynamic. Some countries are manufacturers of COVID kits. Some countries are manufacturers of molecular equipment and reagents. So if you need your country to be part of those countries that are probably buying less of the reagents, uh, molecular equipments, COVID testing kits, and move towards vaccinating your people, you need to play the global politics involved. That means if India is a manufacturer for COVID um, vaccine, you need to have a diplomatic agreement with India. Now, the question is, what can we bring on the table? Because for you to have a, a diplomatic negotiation with any particular country, there should be something on the table. There should be something in it for them. Now, Nigeria, we've been that country where a lot of investors are scared of coming into the country because of our forest situation, so many other situations and the crisis happening in the country at the moment, the insecurity and so on and so forth. So how do you expect to have a COVID vaccine and invite investors when it's even difficult for you to invite investors for other things in, like, happening in Nigeria at the moment? So these are the dynamics that we need to look at in as much as, yes, we need to produce our own vaccine. We are all pro-vaccine production. We are all, all about that. But when you look at the dynamics, are we ready to produce vaccine at the moment? Can we sustain vaccine production even when we start? I think there are certain things that should be put on the line. First, diplomatic relationships, improving our diplomatic relationships and making sure that our country is conducive enough for investors to bring in their money and repatriate their money back. Nobody wants to bring in millions of dollars into this country and leave it to be stuck down here in Nigeria. Airlines are complaining as well. So these are the things that we need to look at before we say, okay, um, yeah, we should go ahead with bringing in investors. Because in as much as we have the numbers, it doesn't make sense for any investor to bring their money here and they can't take their money back. Well, uh, I'm also hoping that, um, uh, because I feel like the dependency on the Western world is becoming too much 
for the continent. And I'm thinking that the collaboration, it's time that the entire continent come together and look inwards and find out how all of this relationship can be between themselves. And of course, we'll come out as a formidable force against the Western world because of course, they would always protect their interests as much as we try to push for that. But we do really appreciate your thoughts and thank you uh, so much for being part of the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's the much that we can take. Uh, we've uh, had a fine lady and a gentleman, the Honorable Commissioner for Health Cross River State, Dr. Bataraji, and also Namani uh, for also being part of the conversation and expert. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll head straight to the second conversation. Please stick around.